Ty Dillon is officially heading GMS's Cup Series program for 2022. There is another new Cup Series team that is being formed that will be part-time in 2022. And Rick Ware has formed an alliance with SHR and will get Roush Yates engines. And they also have talked to Matt Benedetto and Ryan Newman about potentially driving for them next year. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to another video. We've got a ton of the stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go and just jump straight into those really, really quickly. We're going to start off PJ1 for Texas. As coming up this weekend at Texas Motor Speedway, NASCAR is no longer going to be using PJ1 at Texas Motor Speedway. There will be no more PJ1. Scott Miller confirmed that today. Instead, they're going to be using a resin compound they have used at Nashville and Michigan. I think the resin works a lot better than the PJ1. I still think that the PJ1 effects are still going to be there, but I think with the resin being applied at Texas Motor Speedway, I do think that it at least for sure is going to take some of the major effects from the PJ1 to me. I think it was really, really good. I think the resin is going to help potentially create better multi-groove racing. Again, we saw a little bit better racing in Michigan, though it was really single file. But again, I do think the package with it being on a two-mile track did affect it. It was kind of similar to the 2019 spring early race in 2019 when Joe Logano won that event when he pretty much dominated that race. But we're not going to see PJ1 in Texas, which makes me really, really happy. And I think NASCAR said using PJ1 from now on. I think you're going to be using going to more of this resin combine. I like it. I think it's a better move in my honest opinion. And I like the move overall in my honest and sincere opinion. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Sage Karam. As Sage Karam is expected to drive the 31 for Jordan Anderson Racing at the season finale at Phoenix Raceway. Sage Karam has already made two or three starts so far in the Xfinity Series for Jordan Anderson Racing. He made his first Xfinity Series start at the Indianapolis Road Course where I believe he ran pretty decent and got a top 20 finish. He also has ran Bristol where he finished 16th. And he was on the verge of getting a top 10 this past weekend at the Charlotte Roll for the Xfinity Series. Ran extremely well, ran in the top 5 and top 10 in that event. But unfortunately, he got hit with a 30-second time penalty because he did not stop in that starting position because they wrecked on the last lap of that event. So he did not get a good finish, but he finished 26 in the event because of that. But Jor, I absolutely really like C. Sage Karam continue racing in the sport. I think Sage Karam's done an excellent job driving for Jordan Anderson race so far in the few races. I know his finishes don't really show for it, but I think he's done pretty well. And I like what Sage Karam's been doing. And another thing that's really cool about this is more IndyCar drivers from the IndyCar side of things, the more crossover you have in sports, I think the better it is overall for the going to be for the sport. So I'm really happy to see that Sage Karam is going to continue racing in the NASCAR. It basically is going to continue racing in the Xfinity Series with Jordan Anderson racing. I'm really happy about it. I'm looking forward to this for sure. I think it's really, really awesome to see that for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Speed 51. As Speed 51 has announced that they are going to be rebranding from Speed 51 to Racing America, which is also going to start featuring some NASCAR Cup Series content on their channel as well. On top of that, Matt Weaver has been hired as Racing America's Editor-in-Chief. I'm really happy for Matt. This is one of the big reasons I want to talk about this is because Matt Weaver, I've had a lot of respect for him as a reporter. I think he's one of the most underrated reporters out there in the NASCAR industry. And he's done an excellent job. He's covered a lot of big events, including one of the main guys who's been covering the whole situation at the National Fairgrounds. I've been a huge fan of Matt. I think he's done an excellent job for the last couple of years. He also does, in my opinion, a pretty sol solid job when he does AEW content and WWE content as well. So I'm really happy to see that he is going to continue working with the company and the editor-in-chief. That is awesome. And I think for the company as a whole, the, the rebranding for the company is really going to be big. I know people are probably not going to be happy that they're moving over to Speed 51, but I think this is one thing from the Racing Team Alliance. I'm not a big fan of the charters, but the RTA, they basically, I think, at least got one thing right, and I think Speed 51 doing the Race in America stuff is really, really good. And not only that, I do think that this could have a huge impact in the future going forward on a potential streaming services going forward for NASCAR putting some of their stuff on streaming services going forward, including like old races. So we'll have to wait and see what happens, but I'm really happy to see this. I think it's a really good decision that they're doing this, and I'm really happy about it for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're talking about William Byron, as William Byron, as reported by William by uh, Chris Knight, that William Byron has a big announcement coming up in the next week. Rick Hendrick says there's an announcement coming for him. Now, it is believed that it is going to be sponsorship 
for William Byron. I would be shocked if it's contract extension. No, William Byron's contract does go through 2022. I would expect it probably in the next year, next couple of months, we're probably going to hear what's going on with William Byron past 2022. And he's probably going to be returning to Hendrick Motorsports for a long time. They said they're working on a long-term contract for him. But the really cool thing about this is William Byron, I think, has been really, really solid this year. Yes, unfortunately, he got eliminated from the round of 12. But I think for a guy to make the playoffs, he's been really improving over the last year or so. I think it's really awesome to see that he's continuing to pick up new sponsorships and brands. And it's really good for him for the foreseeable future because the more funny you can bring to a team the better overall is going to be for the sport and good for Hendrick Motorsports Sports as well to keep that 24 funded wonder what it's going to be I'm wondering if it's going to be Liberty University getting a full sponsorship I know they've had issues with Liberty University with the political landscape and all that stuff but I think it's excellent that will that William Byron is going to get more sponsorship going forward I'm really happy about it. I'm looking forward to find out what their sponsorship situation is going to be going forward and now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we are talking about Ben Bayshore, as Ben Bayshore is going to be spending for this upcoming race at Texas Motor Speedway. And the reason is, is because they had two missing lug nuts and they had a $20,000 fine that is being added with that suspension as well. I think that this is really a bad week, especially since Kyle Busch is not that far, is actually below the cutoff line right now. The fact he's not going to have Ben Bayshore, I think, has helped him this year a lot on the pit box. I think especially to track like Texas Motor Speedway, where Kyle Busch won last year with Adam Stevens in the Cup Series at the fall race and getting his only one of the year in 2020. I think that this is really, really crucial that he does not run really, really bad. And I think that without having his really good crew chief to work with him at that event, I think that that is overall going to be really, really bad as a whole for Kyle Busch. I just hope going forward that at least for this upcoming, Kyle Busch can run really, really well. It is one week. I wish that crew chiefs would not be suspended for two missing limits because sometimes you can't control that. I know the crew chief is sometimes at fault for that, but I don't think the crew chief can overall control, in my opinion, what happens on the pit box but we'll probably see what happens going forward really really soon and hopefully we will not see Kyle but what well, we see Kyle Bush be able to have a chance to make it to the next round and not have problems and hopefully he won't fall behind after this weekend at Texas and now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the rear bumper situation for this past weekend at the Star Robo if you watch the Cup Series race Kevin Harvick got into the back of Chase Elliott, dumped him from and basically payback from what happened at Bristol. And Chase Elliott had a bumper cover that was starting to fly off with around 25 laps to go. Now, NASCAR basically said in this position, I'll read this, is not mandatory piece on the road course to the rear bumper. And not a situation where the back flag was necessary for that flag to be revealed and to Chase Elliott. I'm going to say this about the black flag situation. Chase Elliott had a bumper cover fly off, and NASCAR was in a tough position there because you have a guy who's in the playoffs who's trying to make it into the next round. I don't think NASCAR is going to want to give Chase Elliott a penalty. I don't think if you were in the playoffs, I don't think NASCAR is going to want to give anybody a penalty that is trying to go for the NASCAR Cup Series championship still at this particular point. But they have penalized drivers for bumper cover problems. I believe they penalized Eric Jones last year, and they also, I believe, penalized Ben Rose earlier this year for a similar situation. To me, I absolutely think that if going forward, and there needs to be a precedent set, we no longer, I don't care if in the playoffs or not, no longer can you penalize a driver for this situation so we don't have a repeat of these problems going forward. Because if they penalize, again, going into next year, if they penalize a non-playoff driver, that shows that they're inconsistent. To me, I would have penalized Chase Elliott. I understand he's trying to make it to the playoffs, and I understand the Astro was in a top position there, but at the same time, I would have penalized Chase Elliott in my honest opinion, but that is just my honest opinion on that. Now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're talking about Matt McCall. Now, it was reported yesterday about Bob Pockers that there has been garage chatter for the last several days about Matt McCall potentially being Brad Kislowski's crew chief for the 2022 season. This absolutely shocked me when this was reported because I really thought at this point that the guy who's going to be crew chiefing the six car, which I believe that's Luke Lambert who crew chiefs the six car, who they just changed crew chiefs for Rosh Jimmy Racing, they just announced that they were changing that going into this weekend. So I'm really surprised that Matt McCall is potentially going to be moving over to Rosh Jimmy Racing. My big question going forward in regards to this is one. What ha if this ends up happening, what happens to Luke Lambert? Does Luke Lambert move to another organization, maybe where he becomes a crew chief for Kurt Busch? Or does Luke Lambert move to another organization and work with somebody else? I'm really, really intrigued to see what happens there. My other question is, what happens to Kurt Busch and his crew chief? Because I think a lot of people assumed that Matt McCall has been working with Kurt Busch for the last three years 
Everyone pretty much assumed that Matt McCall was probably overall for sure going to be the crew chief for Kurt Busch going into next year. I'm very shocked that this is happening, to be perfectly honest, that Matt McCall may no longer be the crew chief for Kurt Busch going into next year and might be going over to Brad Keselowski. Now, Matt McCall, I think, is a very, very soft crew chief as a whole. He wasn't that great when Jamie McMurray was in the car, but let's be honest. I don't think that one car was really, really good. I can't blame Matt McCall for that. But I think ever since Kurt Busch has gotten into that position, I think that car has improved. And I think that they had a good chemistry together for the last two years. You don't see Kurt Busch getting as mad at Matt McCall as much. So I'm really surprised to see that it's potential that we're not going to see Matt McCall crew chief for Kurt Busch next year. I'm very, very surprised about that. I wonder if someone else is going to be Kurt Busch crew chief that we don't know about. Danny Hamlin has said that it's going to be someone that Kurt Busch is really comfortable with. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens in regards to that. But it's really intriguing that Matt McCall may no longer be the crew chief for Kurt Busch going into next year. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're going to talk about Colton Herta and Andretti Autosport in their F1 endeavors. We've reported on this channel a couple times, but there's more talk from multiple sources, including Autosport. And they reported that Andretti Autosports is close to a deal to take majority stake in the Sauber F1 racing team. And on top of which, they're expected to do it for $400 million and take 80% ownership stake into the organization. We already know, I believe at this point, that uh, Valtteri Bottas will be driving for the organization, but we do not know who's currently driving the second car. But here's the thing. There is potential going into next year's F1 season that Colton Herta is potentially going to go to F1 next year. Now, I have some mixed feelings about this, to be perfectly honest with you, if Colton Herter does become the driver. First question, does he have enough super license points? I know they do give exceptions to other drivers, but you have to have a certain amount of super license points to be able to qualify for that. I think he's only got 30 points right now, and I think it's required to get 35 or 40 points to have enough super license points to be required. I wonder if they would give an exception to Colton Herta. My second decision is one... I really don't under, would un understand Andretti making this decision, considering you have Colin Herta, who I think is the next great American superstar after Joseph Newgard. He has won the last two straight races in IndyCar and has six career IndyCar wins, and he's only 21 years old. And I don't think you want to take that superstar out of IndyCar, who's really, really good right now. You don't want to take that superstar out of IndyCar. I think he's been really, really solid so far in the IndyCar series. I just don't think it's made a lot of sense. And I know they're changing the F1 regulations, and I wonder if Andretti Autosport would be able to come in there, Michael Andretti, and fix Sauber's organization and fix the problems. I am just not convinced, though, that they're going to be able to fix these problems at Sauber and be as, as competitive. I, I mean, Valtteri Botas is going to be there to help next year, and Valtteri's just coming off a win this past weekend in Turkey in F1. But still, I just don't understand why he would go ahead and change it, considering he's been really, really solid so far with those organizations. I just don't understand that in my opinion. That being said, I think another great American F1 team would be really, really awesome for F1. And having potential American drivers going over, you look at Formula 1's impact with basically America with F1, we've seen huge increase in ratings. There's my, We're going to have two F1 races in the United States, Coda and a Miami street race, and there's potential there may be a third race going forward in the Las Vegas area. We'll have to wait and see what happens, but it's very possible that this is going to happen, and it's definitely intriguing for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about GMS Racing. As GMS Racing revealed in the other big announcements we'll get to later in today's episode, but GMS Racing said as well, in addition, that they plan to run three camping world trucks in 2022. In addition to that, they are expected to keep Daniel Dye in their ARCA Series program in 2022. It has already been announced that Grant Enfinger will drive the 23 truck, and Jack Wood is going to drive the 24 truck as well. My big question is who is going to be that third driver for GMS Racing? Because there's going to be a riot potential between three drivers who could be going there. I think the most likely that's going to end up getting that right, and I know a lot of people are not going to go potential. There's four drivers I think that could get that third GMS right. First one, Zane Smith. Though I'm going to say Zane Smith is probably the least likely because I think Zane Smith is going to be moving up to Xfinity next year, whether this was College Racing or another organization, the RCR programs, I think that Zane Smith will be jumping up to the Xfinity Series going into next year. The second potential, I would say, is Tyler Ankrum. I think Tyler Ankrum's got a decent shot of going back there, but there's been talk that Lee Uana is potentially backing out of the GMS program next year, so there's probably not going to be him who's going there next year. The third driver, and I think is the second most likely, I would say, is Rafael Lassard. And the reason I bring up Rafael Lassard is because Rafael Lassard, in his Twitter bio, and he hasn't changed it over the last couple of weeks, 
in his Twitter bio. He says that he has GMS Racing in his Twitter bio, and I don't think he had that originally a few weeks ago until he put it in. So I think it's very, very likely that he could potentially be the driver for that car. But the a driver that I really think, and I'm not a fan of saying this, I think the person who's going to end up in that third GMS right for that two truck, I think is going to be Chase Party. And the reason I say this is because Chase Party brings a lot of funny. But I'll be honest, I don't think Chase Party absolutely at all deserves to go to GMS's truck program. He's absolutely been horrible. He's underperformed all year. He doesn't deserve the ride, in my honest opinion. He's not been very, very good. And I really don't care for Chase Party. I was okay, decent fan of it when he got announced he was potentially going to drive this truck. But I'm not a fan of him. I don't think he's a really good driver, in my honest opinion. He's not done that great for the for GMS racing. He's been by far the worst performing driver at GMS. Yes, he's been worse than Jack Wood. And Jack Wood really hasn't been that good. But in the other side of things... Let's talk about this move. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially since they're going to cut full-time next year. I do think it makes a lot of sense for GMS to downsize the three trucks. I think especially bringing Grant and Finger to the organization next year. I think this team is going to form a lot better, and I think that they'll be a much more competitive team. I think the problem with GMS that they've had is they have too many trucks right now, and they have been struggling. You look at also JD Motorsports and Spinning for a similar situation. I think they're focusing on too many trucks, and if they downsize, I think that they are going to form a lot better, in my honest opinion. But that is just my honest opinion on that. And now we're going to move on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Mark Trish Jr. and him not being very happy with Joey Hamm. So in the latter stages of the race that happened at the Star Row, Joey Han got into the back of Mark Truex Jr. in the bus stop in the backstretch and spun Martin Truex Jr. And Mark Truex Jr. went for sure 100% being safe at that time to potentially having a chance if William Byron was able to win the race, he had a potential shot of getting eliminated. So after the race, Mark Truex Jr. was not very happy with Joey Han and he ran into the back of him at the conclusion of the race and they were not very happy with each other. And then basically he criticized the Rick Ware racing cars. Now, I want to make this really, really clear. I don't think Joey, what Joey Hand did was absolutely egregious. I don't think what he absolutely did was on purpose. I do understand that we should agree that playoff drivers at least be treated with a lot of respect out there. And I understand that. But at the same time, Joey Hand is trying to race for positions. And not to mention, this is a Stuart Haas racing prepared car. And Joey Hand actually was doing pretty decent out there. He's running in the top 30 a lot of events. I know people bring up he was all over the place in the race. But still... I do think it personally, I don't think Joey Hand is a bad race car driver. In fact, Joey Hand is a guy who's won a class of the 24 Hours of Le Mans and has also won the 24 Hours of Daytona as well. So for people saying he's a newbie, I understand before he should have practice qualifying for getting an event. He is not a slouch on road courses, though. And not only that, he's going to be able to help out during the next-gen test, which is going on at the moment. He's going to be able to help out with the next-gen test and get these cars up to speed for the organization. So I don't 100% agree and understand why Marge. I understand Mark Truex Jr. is upset. He's trying to fight for a playoff spot. But at the same time, personally, I think that Joey Hand has every right to be out there to go out there and try to get as many positions as possible. That being said, I feel bad for Mark Truex Jr. because he did get basically bumped. Not to mention, Mark Truex Jr. should not even been back there to begin with. His car was absolutely horrible yesterday. So I think that's another reason why he was frustrated. And I guess he wanted to take it out on somebody because he was not very bad. That's just my honest opinion on that. And I think it's really interesting. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Kyle Busch not being very happy with Kevin Harvick. We'll get into the feud, end of the feud, hopefully, between Chase Lee and Kevin Harvick here in just a second. But I want to talk about Kyle Busch's thoughts on Kevin Harvick throughout the race. And Kyle Busch said at the conclusion of the Cup Series race that the four, which is Kevin Harvick, was running over everybody, wasn't making friends out there, and said, you know who the dirty drivers are. When you have Kyle Busch saying that, who's been historically known to kind of be a little bit of a dirty driver and be really aggressive, especially when he was younger, not as much now, but especially when he was younger, you know that you have really been giving yourself a bad name. And I'll say this, I think Kyle Busch, yes, again, he has tempers and stuff, but Kyle Busch is a really smart driver and one of the best to race in the sport. So I 100% understand his comments and his frustrations against Kevin Harvick. And Kevin Harvick, like I said, was running into people and he got into Chase Elliott early in the race, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But I think it's definitely really interesting that Kyle Busch is not happy. Are we going to see potentially a fan bases unite? Chase Elliott and Kyle Busch, 
I think a lot of Chase Elliott fans are happy with Kyle Busch right now that they're mad at Kevin Harvick. And I don't think anybody could have said that last year after the situation that happened with Kyle Busch and Chase Elliott early at Darlington. But they made up on their terms going into Charlotte, and they had a really good talk after the race. And they really were like kind of talking and like good friends at that particular point. So definitely interesting for sure that Kyle Busch was not happy with Kevin Harvick. I find it intriguing because Kyle Busch knows what a, what a dirty driver is, and he knows how what happens in those situations. So to me, I definitely find it interesting for sure that that happened. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. And we're now going to talk about the Chase Elliott versus Kevin Harvick situation. I'm going to give a little bit of backstory on the situation. We'll go all the way back to Bristol. I'm not going to go through everything that's happened because it's going to take me a long time to get there. But basically, at Bristol, Chase Elliott and Kevin Harvick were battling for the win. Chase Elliott gets a cut tire. Chase Elliott comes back not very happy, runs into Kevin Harvick, trying to cut his tires out. Chase Elliott holds up Kevin Harvick. Kyle Larson gets a win at Bristol. Kevin Harvick and Chase Elliott have a post-race confrontation. Kevin Harvick calls that move what Chase Elliott did. A shit, Chase Elliott, excuse me, a chicken shit move. And Chase Elliott basically says, I don't care. I want to be respected out there. I don't care how old he is, how long he's been racing the sport. I want to be respected. Then they talked after the race and they had the white PR guy that was Kevin Harvest, the guy in the white shirt, basically come in there. And then Jordy Bianchi got yelled at as well at the same time by Kevin Harvick, who didn't know who the heck he is. And Kevin Harvick doesn't know what the heck, doesn't understand who the heck he's talking to at that particular point. But on top of that, in that situation, going into the next week, Chase Elliott seemed like he moved on. He was the more mature driver. Kevin Harvick, on the other hand, was still not very happy with Chase Elliott at that particular point. And said that it was like talking to a nine-year-old kid. He has said that to Bob Pockers, speaking to the media on the day of the race. To me, I think Chase Elliott in the whole situation has shown maturity. And keep in mind, Chase Elliott is only like half the age of Kevin Harvick. Chase Elliott is 25 Kevin Harvick is 45, going to be 46. And Kevin Harvick said he was that had been the maddest he's ever been as a driver. Madder than other situations? I mean, I'm surprised about that. Things boil, though, down today. Chase Elliott got dumped by Kevin Harvick halfway through the race. Kevin Harvick gassed it up on purpose and dumped Chase Elliott in the end of the inner loop, going into turn number one on the normal oval, and he basically dumped Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott tried to come back and hit Kevin Harvick and unfortunately collected his teammate, Cole Custer. Then Chase Elliott gets back in the lead lap after that caution comes out. And Kevin Harvick basically, who gets intimidated and gets basically scared, basically runs into the outside wall with 10 laps to go and destroys the car and gets eliminated from the playoffs. Then Kevin Harvick in the post-race media seemed like he was shook, seemed like he was really, really scared. He said, remember Bristol, and said bygones be bygones, and all that stuff. Chase Elliott responded by saying, that hope he has a merry, merry off season and a happy Christmas, and hopefully he basically will send Christmas cards and all that stuff in the future. I'll say this. I think Kevin Harvick absolutely deserved what he got. I don't want to hear anything. Kevin Harvick did, did was a little bit of a chicken shit move. I understand. It was way more egregious. Kevin Harvick had no, not as a right to be upset as Chase Elliott did, and Chase Elliott had more of a right to be upset from the situation at Bristol because he finished 25th, and Kevin Harvick still finished second. The difference is Kevin Harvick still finished up front. Chase Elliott finished 25th, three laps down in the race because of that. And he still finished second and got a lot of points. I think, personally, Kevin Harvick was 100% in the wrong. I think Kevin Harvick added a little bit more. I Rick Hendrick also responded to the situation as well. And he says that he hopes going forward that both these guys can get along and get this situation figured out. Because he said it's absolutely ridiculous that we're still having situations like this, which I totally 100% understand and agree for Rick Hendrick in that situation. Because I think it's boiled to a very, very big T. I hope that things are done. I really hope that we're done with this feud because at this point it's getting a little bit ridiculous. And hopefully we can move on from the situation going forward. The Heroes won yesterday. And I think personally we got a good driver winning the race. Well, we got a good driver winning the race. Kyle Larson with his probable comeback. But I think at that same time we got to see a feud basically hopefully come to a close. And hopefully things don't go forward. I think Chase Elliott's moved on from the situation. I hope Kevin Harvick has moved on from the situation. Hopefully things going forward can get resolved going forward. So I hope things can end really, really soon. We're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Richard Childress Racing. As Richard Childress Racing has announced that Whelan as a full season sponsor for the 2022 season. On top of that, Sheldon Creed is going to be driving the two car for RCR Racing full time in 2022. This confirms that Maya Setter will not be back in the two car next year in 2022, and we'll get to that in just a second. I'm really happy to see that Sheldon Creed is officially going to the two car full time. Not only that, I'm really excited to see that he's got full season 
season sponsorship, and he's not going to have to worry about any sponsorship because that's one thing I think Sheldon Creed has struggled for over the last year or so. And the fact that Whelan is going to be stepping up to play to sponsor him on a full-time basis is really, really cool. And they said they're hoping to win a championship. And to me, I think that he absolutely deserves to go to the two car over second one. I think he deserves to be in the flagship car. And I think that RC are going to the next year. I think they have their overall best opportunity to win a championship than since 2019. I don't think they're going to win it, but I think that they're going to form a lot better. I think Sheldon Creed absolutely will potentially have a chance to win it. I actually think he wins a few races, and I think he'll be very, very competitive. He's going to have to go up against a lot of tough competition. Guys like Josh Berry, um, AJ Allmendinger, Daniel Hemrick, uh, I think Ty Gibbs will be full-time. John Hunter on those guys are probably going to have to go up to, but I think he'll do very, very well. He'll be up front. He's proven himself at GMS this year. He absolutely deserves it. Of course, GMS has somewhat of an RCR alliance, which makes a lot of sense. So I'm really happy to see for sure that he is going to be going to the two flagship car going into the next year. I'm really happy about that overall for sure. Speaking of which, we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're going to talk more about Richard Chose Racing. As Richard Chose Racing was reported that they are finalizing a deal for a second Richard Chose Racing Xfinity Series car. It is not expected to be my Sider who is going to return to that car next year. Sider, however, is expected to return to RCR's GM's development programs and other potential RCR affiliates going into next year as well. My first question is about my Sider. Where do I think my Sider is going to end up next year? I think there's a few organizations he could go to. He absolutely could go to Colorado Racing for that third car. Jeb Byrne, we don't know currently what his plans are at this given time. However, I don't think he's going to end up at that ride. I think that Austin Hill actually may end up at that third car ride, which would make a lot of sense. I think he has potential of going there. Big Machine Racing is not on the table. Big Machine is not expected to run two cars, and Jay Buford is going to be there next year. Jordan Anderson Racing could be open up, but I don't know what's going on with Jordan Anderson Racing. The team that I think my side is going to end up at next year, I think is going to be Our Motorsports. Our Motorsports has an alliance with Richard Chillis Racing, a pretty big alliance as a whole. Not only that, it's unclear what's going on with both their cars going into next year. And I would think that if Our Motorsports is smart, they would put a full-time guy in their second car instead of running rotation of drivers in their program. I think it would make a lot of sense to do that in my honest and sincere opinion. To me, we'll have to wait and see what happens on my side. But who's going to get that second Xfinity Series car for RCR? I think it's either going to be two drivers. Or Austin Hill, who ends up going there next year. Or I actually do think the other driver potentially, maybe Matt Benedetto, but we may hear what's going on with Matt Benedetto going forward. I think it's going to be either Austin Hill or Zane Smith. I think that Zane Smith could potentially go to that second ride. I think Zane Smith is ready for the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And I think it'll be great for the sport as a whole to have another driver like him go up. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in regards to our Xfinity Series, Series program going into next year. But I'm really happy that they're making some pretty big moves as a whole for the organization. I'm really excited for that for sure. So I think it's really, really awesome. And now we're going to jump on to the first of three sections of major stories of today's episode. As we're going to talk about Rick Ware Racing. As Rick Ware Racing has announced that they have formed an alliance with Stuart Haas Racing for 2022 and 2023 as well. And they're also going to be getting some Roush Yates engines going into next year as well. Rick Ware has also said that they have sponsorship for two cars going into 2022 and is still to be determined on a third car. They are planning to downsize next year to at least two cars, and they may run a third car next year, but it's dependent on sponsorship. It's unclear if they're going to be keeping the Petty Ware. They're talking about leasing that Petty Ware chart at this given moment. I want to first talk about this. I know we make a lot of jokes about Rick or Racing and how their program absolutely has not been really that good. We've made programs. Their team is not good. But if you look at the other series they run, they've actually been really, really solid. They've been really solid, solid in the sports car series. They've ran pretty well in those respective series. They've ran pretty well in IndyCar, and they've had Ramon Grosjean on their organization. And even Cody Ware ran pretty decent in these events. But they are getting pretty big upgrades here. I know a lot of people are going to look at this and say, oh, but look at SHR. They've absolutely struggled this year with their error problems. This really isn't much of an upgrade. The thing is, I think that this is a huge acquisition for the Rick Ware camp. They have said that they have been wanting to be more competitive, and they're also downsizing at least to two, probably going to have three cars next year, but they're for sure going to downsize to two car, at least downsize next year one of their cars. Downsizing also is going to help the organization going into next year as well and focus on only have two or three cars going next year is going to be much better. On top of that, they're getting in-house Roush Yates engines. I'm not expecting Rick Ware Racing to ultimately be a winning team right away. I don't think they're even going to be immediately a top 10 team. 
But I think that Ricker Racing is going to jump from the back of the field. And I think they're, they're going to run quite a bit in the top, some top 15s, some top 20s. Maybe they'll snag a top 10, for all we know, on a non-super speedway or non-road course track. They may be able to do that. And this alliance is going to be really huge for the team going forward. I'm really excited about this if they're getting SHR engines. I think if we kind of knew this kind of was maybe was coming with Joey Hand getting an SHR prepared car. I'm really happy about this because to me, I think that Rick, Rick Ware can really show that they do want to improve as a whole, as an organization. I do think it's great. Again, I want to see Rick Ware succeed. I want to see everything that comes into NASCAR succeed. It's just that they have been kind of a back market team for a long time. We've made a lot of jokes about them. But the fact that they are going to be upgrading their cars, and this is going to be upgrades. They're not going to be a back market team anymore. They're going to be a much better team. They're going to take some big steps going forward. And to me, I think it makes a lot of sense as a whole to keep running the car going into next year. They're going to have good equipment next year to me. I think they become a much better team. Like I said, I think they're going to be a top 15, top 20 team. And I think the jokes about them running in the back, I think, are going to be over. I really think that they're going to be much better. They're not going to be the same team they've been over the last years with the with the upgrades. I'm really excited about this for Rick or Racy. I'm really excited because I think it's great for the organization as a whole. And now we're going to move on to the next part of this Rick or Racing story as we're going to talk about Ryan Newman and Matt the Benedetto. It was reported by Candace Spencer that Ryan, that Rick Ware has had open conversations with Ryan Newman and Matt the Benedetto about potentially driving for them next year in 2022. You heard that right. There is potential that both not only Ryan Newman could be driving for the team, but also Matt the Benedetto has had conversations with them as well. Now, Ryan Newman and Matt the Benedetto, they are both probably the top two free agents currently, besides maybe Ryan Priest. That are still open at that particular moment. I think Ryan Priest is going to end up at another organization going forward. But first, both these guys absolutely would be great additions to the organization for a third car if they're going to run a third car next year. I think that both guys have a lot of talent. I think Matt Mendetto, ever since he's gotten uh, Jonathan Hassler as a crew chief, I think he's absolutely rapport proof very, very well. I think Greg Irwin was ultimately the problem because ever since Matt Mendetto got Jonathan Hassler, I think he's performed a ton better than he did with Greg Irwin. He's performing a lot better as a driver. The other big thing, Ryan Newman. I think Ryan Newman's a really, really great driver. I think he's coming. He's potentially going to leave in a team. I thought maybe he'd go to Roush, but I think if Rick Ware is an open-up team, he knows engineering. He knows how to work on cars really, really well. So he's going to be able to help an organization if he goes there. So to me, who do I think is going to end up at, at the ride if Rick Ware does? I know some of you will probably bring up neither, but here's the thing. I think one of those guys is going to for sure end up at the Rick Ware Racing Camp next year. It's just who I, who I 100% think is going to end up at it. I think that the driver who is for sure going to end up at the Rickware camp next year, and I think that this is going to cause controversy, I think it's actually going to be Ryan Newman. I know that a lot of people bring up Matt the Benedetto. I think Matty D is really his best chance would be going to Rickware camp. I just don't know if Rickware is going to take advantage of him. Plus, I think that they're going to be looking at someone who brings a lot of funding. And Ryan Newman, I think, does clearly bring that funding. I don't think Matt Benedetto does not really have any funding. And Matt Benedetto has said that he has struggled to basically find rides. And he doesn't, like I said, sponsorship and funding has been the really big struggle. I want to see Matt Benedetto in a good ride. And I do think that Matty D has potential backups going into next year for potential really good rides going forward. So I do think that he will end up in a good ride next Finney, but I don't know where that goes there. But I think Ryan Newman will be the better choice over Matt Benedetto. Ryan Newman knows how to work in organizations. He's been in NASCAR for a long time, so he knows how to get it done. And to me, I think if you're going to choose a driver to go in your organization going into the next year, I would take the guy who has a lot more experience over a guy who's really unknown. I do think that Matty D has a higher ceiling, though, than Ryan Newman. But I think if you're going to choose somebody to go into your organization for Rick or Racing, I do think that they would choose Ryan Newman. My big question is, what does the driver lineup look like for next year? I think going into next year, I think James Davison is going to get one of the full-time cars. I think that there will be a second car that's going to be a part-time car for Rick Ware, which I th which is going to have a bunch of part-time drivers. I think guys like Cody Ware, because I think Cody, I know people bring up for a potential full-time ride. I think that Cody Ware is going to be racing IndyCar next year, so he's probably not going to be able to run the whole season. So I'm sure guys like Cody Ware, Josh Balicki, among others, would get that ride like Garrett Smithley. And someone would probably get more of the time like Cody Ware. And then the third car, if they bring funding, I would assume that soon that would go to Ryan Newman. So I think that's what the driver lineup is going to look like next for next year for Rick Ware. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But hopefully one of those guys is going to end up in that ride going into next year. And now we're going to jump on to the next major story of today's episode. As we're going to talk about Team Hesburgh. That's right. 
Team Hasbrook is going to be joining the Cup Series in 2022, powered by the Rayum Brothers organization. This is a team that was formed by Tony Hesmans, who is the father of Loris Hesmans and a Dutch owner named Ernest Burke. Rayum Brothers Racing is going to be providing the engines and technical support for the organization. And we'll talk about drivers in a second. First thing. Remember when I talked a few, we, I didn't talk about this on the channel, but it was reported by tobychristie.com that there was a Toyota Truck Series team that was going to be moving. And I did some contact clues a few months ago, and I was told that it was most likely going to be Rayman Brothers Racing. We were kind of waiting to see if that wasn't true. But we finally got told Saturday exactly what the plans were going to be. I basically had said in a group chat, like, I think it's going to be they're going to moving up the cup next year. And they are technically moving the cup. Now, big thing, you know, is that they are a Ford next year. They did mention that it depends, it's going to depend on right now what's going to give them the best opportunity. So I think that's why they're going to Ford. But let's talk about the drivers that are going to be driving because this gets crazy as well. The first driver is Larice Hesmans, who will be testing an action car, which is going on today at this given moment. Larice Hesmans, I'll talk about him in a second. But Jacques Villeneuve, you heard that right. Jacques Villeneuve is going to be driving cars while if he really enjoys an action car, which will be testing on Tuesday. They could also be full-time in 2023 if they depended on sponsorship. And they may run the Daytona 500 if they're able to get enough funding and sponsorship for that. First drive, we'll talk about Loris Hesmans. Loris Hesmans, a lot of people are going to look and say, oh, who is this guy? Loris Hesmans is no slash books. Loris Hesmans is a 2019 Euro NASCAR Euro champion. And so far, I believe he's had two or three wins in the NASCAR Euro Series, and he's competing in a few Xfinity Series races where he's actually ran pretty decent. Is at decent pace. So the guy knows how to get it done on road courses, and I think he'll be really good for the team. Jacques Villeneuve, though, is coming back. I want to talk about Jacques Villeneuve for a second. Jacques Villeneuve has not competed in the NASCAR Cup Series, I believe, since 2008 or 2009. And the last time that Jacques Villeneuve competed in NASCAR altogether was, I believe, in 2011 or 2012. And Jacques Villeneuve was known for being really, really aggressive and causing a lot of problems. But he has been competing in the Euro Series for the last couple of years. In 2019, he finished eighth in the championship. He hasn't finished that well over the last couple of years in the NASCAR Euro Series. But I think he'll do pretty decent over here now. Here's the thing I want to talk about is this team. I don't know how they're going to perform, to be perfectly honest with you. I really don't know how to feel about how they're going to perform. I'm really happy to see a new organization for next year. I do think that they're going to have some decent pace. I think the next car is going to keep the field really, really close together. So I do think that they're going to have some decent success. That being said, I don't know how exactly they're going to perform. I don't think they're going to be a top 5 or top 10 team. I don't even think they're going to be a top 20 team. I think that they're going to be a team that's very similar to what Right now, Live Fast Motorsports is. I don't think they're going to run up front in a lot of races. I would, would be very, very shocked if they do run up front. They may get some surprising top 30s in their road course events. And again, I think focusing on just doing one sector, maybe short tracks as well potentially, would be great for the organization to get some focus on those respective series. But to me, I just don't under, I just don't know how they're going to perform next year. I really, really don't know. They're a new team. I think it's great for the sport. It's going to be a layer field next year. But the fact that we do have a new Cup Series team, in 2022, I think is absolutely exciting for the sport's future. The fact that we can bring teams part time. And I know people bring up about a charter. They don't have the funding to run full time right now. So they'll probably in the future run full time. The fact that we've got people from the Europe, the Euro Series coming over is really, really awesome for the sport going forward. Of course, they are partnered with the Rain Brothers organization. But to me, I'm really happy about this. And I'm glad that we're going to see a new Cup Series team in the 2022 season. And now we're going to jump on to the final major story of today's episode. As we're going to talk about Ty Dillon. As it was officially confirmed Sunday morning that Ty Dillon will be officially going to GMS Racing in 2022. And he will be driving the 94 car full-time for the GMS Racing organization. At this current moment, they do not have a charter going into the next year. But they will be an open car at this given moment. And they are hopeful that they are going to be able to obtain a charter going into next year. On top of that, they are also going to have an RCR alliance next year. This does not surprise me. There's been reports for a long time that this was overall expected. First thing I want to say, I, Ty Dillon, I think, is a decent driver. I don't think Ty Dillon's absolutely an amazing driver, but this year, I've watched him in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, and I think he's had some pretty decent statistics as a whole. He's had some top 10s. He's had some top 20s. I remember a couple weeks ago at Las Vegas where he actually finished second in a stage with Jordan Anderson racing gap. And he also has some South Point sponsorship as well. I know that his time at Joe Gibbs Racing Xfinity this year 
was not really that great. I wouldn't entirely blame him for them struggling in that particular event. I was talk first about expectations for the team. First of all, I do think that they are going to end up with a charter. I absolutely think that they're going to be able to find a way to get a charter. Charters are not going to, are coming and going. There's not that many that are available. I think they're going to end up with one of the charters, maybe from front row. Well, I don't think they're going to get from front row, but I think that they're going to end up with one of the charters from another organization going into next year. Probably like a Rick or Racing, perhaps. Maybe Starcom Racing somehow instead of selling it to Spire, they sell it to GMS. I think that they're going to end up with a charter next year, and regardless. They will probably attempt to run the Daytona 500 next year. And again, it's another Cup Series team and a team that's racing in NASCAR currently that's jumping up. And I think a lot of this is the intrigue of the next-gen car. You look over the next last couple of years, Team Hasbrook, for example, jumping up to the Cup Series next year. You've got Call of Racing, who's not only going to have one, but potentially two full-time cars next year in 2022. You've got 2311, who's got two cars next year. And you also have... Trackhouse is going to have two cars next year. Of course, you've had some teams that had to be let go because of this, like Chip Ganassi Racing, who had to get shut down, and Levine Family Racing. But at the same time, this next-gen car is basically going to be really, really good, beneficial for bringing new teams into the sport. I mean, even there's been talk about junior motorsports potentially making the jump up to the Cup Series next year. But one thing I want to talk about is what are my overall expectations as a whole going into next year? Like I said, Ty Dillon is a decent driver, but I don't think it's an amazing driver. But I do think that GMS is going to be a decent team. I'm not expecting to be a really competitive, well, an extremely top-tier team right away. I don't think they're going to be a top-10 team right away. I don't. I think they're going to be on a similar level to what JT Doherty Racing was and what I think Front Row is currently at the moment, which is not bad, but is not amazing. I think it was maybe similar to what Jermaine Racing was when Ty Dillon was driving for their organization. I think they're going to show some promise. I think they're going to show some speed. I think they're going to have some top 10s and some top 15s, but I don't expect them to be winning races right away. I do think as time goes on, because Mike Dean did say that they wanted to keep Ty Dillon in this organization for a very long time, similar to what that is. Another thing I want to really talk about is the history of that number 94 car, because the 94 car, I found this out today, that apparently Mike Dean was a crew chief for Bill Elliott when Bill Elliott drove the 94 cars. So that's why they chose the 94 car. But I think that this team will have some decent success going into next year. I expect them to probably be a top. I think that they'll get some top 10s next year, a couple. I think they're going to get a lot of top 20s. I don't expect them to make the playoffs next year unless they win a super speedway race next year. And Ty Dillon actually is a pretty solid super speedway racer. So I think he could surprise a lot of people and get a win on super speedways. I think that they will be able to find a charter going into next year. They are going in as an open car currently at the moment. But I think they're going to be able to find a charter going into next year. I am happy, though, that Ty Dillon was able to find a ride. I just wish if they were going to choose somebody else, maybe like a Ryan Priest or Manny D, I think they would have should have gone over with them. But Ty Dillon does bring funding and sponsorship. And I think the RCR Alliance definitely helps for sure, considering, like I said, they have an RCR Alliance. They're going to be working with RCR. They're probably going to get some good engines going next year. Because, of course, Ty Dillon is a grandson of Richard Schultz. So that probably does help the team going forward. To me, I'm really happy at least Ty Dillon has a ride going into next year. I think it's great for the sport that we at least get to see Ty Dillon continue returning to the Cup Series. Because he even said yesterday during the press conference that he was not even sure if he was going to be returning to the Cup Series next year. He didn't know it at that particular time. So at least it's good to hear that Ty Dillon will be returning to the NASCAR Cup Series next year. I'm really happy for him, and I'm happy that he will continue racing in the NASCAR Cup Series going into next year. So, anyway, that is it for today's NASCAR news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe to the channel, notification to be notified when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support our page as well. Let's get your ball for that, and comment with your thoughts on today's video. What are your thoughts about Ty Dillon driving full-time for GMS Racing? How well do you think they're going to form next year? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about all the other stuff that we talked about today on the channel? Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video. And I'll see you guys next time for some more great and awesome NASCAR content on this channel like this. Take care, everybody.